Coming up today on the show, potentially some good news on the injury front for the Seahawks as they try to bounce back from that loss in Detroit on Monday night. Three of those four starting defensive linemen who missed the Detroit game will be back in practice this week. I'll tell you what I think it means. And then I said I wouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it. It's all for fun. I'm going to try to predict the rest of the schedule for the Seahawks and tell you what I think their final record is going to be. Stay tuned for that. It's coming up next on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you like what you see and hear. And hit that bell so you get notification of future episodes. All the other ways to support the channel are down in the description below. Uh, let's start with the good news, shall we? The storyline coming out of Detroit, the loss at Ford Field, 42-29 on Monday night to drop the Seahawks to 3-1, and one, was centered mostly around the guys missing on defense. Injuries on all teams right now at this point in the season. And there's been some people in the comments and, and, and on Twitter this week with me questioning, hey, I thought we had good depth. Well, nobody can withstand missing an entire starting unit. Imagine a team missing their entire starting offensive line, all five guys. The Seahawks were missing five of their seven front seven, and then they lost Julian Love early in the game. But the, the entire starting defensive line, so let me just address that really quick. The Seahawks' depth up front is much better, but depth doesn't mean, hey, let's, let's call the B team in off the bench, right? This isn't the uh, U.S. Olympic basketball team. Uh, it means that you have guys that can rotate in and there's not a drop off there. Thought they, uh, on rewatch, thought they held up as well as we could expect them to given some of the limitations in their game. They're backups for a reason, right? We didn't have the dynamic penetrators up front that we like to have. And then we saw on tape, there's some com communication issues and some assignment issues because those guys haven't played much, certainly haven't played together. But Yesterday at his press conference, Mike McDonald did say that Leonard Williams, Boye Mafe, and Duchenne Nwosu will at least be on the practice field today. Uh, I think today, he said, was a walkthrough, um, or yesterday was a walkthrough, and so today we will get uh, the official injury report, and we'll see how those guys look. But that's good news, right? I mean, there was some thought uh, coming out of the Detroit game that maybe they hold those guys out against New York as well especially knowing that they got to turn around three days later, well, with three days prep, and play the 49ers on Thursday night football. Um, against this Giants team, and I'm going to take a formal look at the Giants tomorrow and kind of crunch the numbers and, and do a proper preview, um, just getting one or two of those guys back would help. Certainly, the return of Uchenna Nwosu. We know how good he is against the run. We saw that last year, even. Um and that's been an issue for them. It certainly was in the New England game, and it was at times Monday. They only gave up about 100 yards rushing, but it was it was big runs and key moments uh, that turned the tide at certain points of that game. So good news there. We'll keep you posted on that. Um, Byron Murphy, as expected, I think, is going to take a little bit longer. Hamstrings are tricky, and he's such a dynamic talent, and, and that position is so, so dependent on your hamstrings as well as other other things especially i mean his hamstrings are more formidable <clears throat> than uh than most uh let's make sure that guy's fully healthy when he comes back right some other injury updates as far as the pup list is concerned the window for abe lucas to return is not being activated yet still waiting for him to come back but cameron young last year's fourth round draft pick out of mississippi state um, he is going to start practicing or the window is open. So now he has 21 days, the team does, for him to be able to practice and for them to make a decision on activating him. If he's not ready to be activated at the end of those 21 days, he has to stay on PUP for the rest of the season. That is good news. Certainly could have used a healthy Cam Young this week in, in Detroit. You know, we really don't know what we have in him, but going back to his college tape and his, his scouting profile, just a... A fighter, you know, one scout called him a junkyard dog, a guy that can do the dirty work inside, and certainly a guy who can fit the profile of being that true 
uh, zero technique, one technique, nose tackle, backup for Jonathan Hankins, a guy at 32 years of age. You want to try to limit his snaps. So some potential good news there. Now, let's have some fun today, shall we? And I want to emphasize that because as, as much as I try to be objective, I can't. I'm a fan, and I've been a fan my entire life or the Seahawks' entire life because I've been, I'm older than they are. Uh, season ticket holder my whole life. I've been to every play, home playoff game. Have I do this? You know, it's part of my daily life. It's it's one of the the fibers of the foundation of my life. So it's hard to be objective, even though that's the approach I try to take. Right? I try to lean on my journalistic instincts and uh, and look at it from an outsider's view. But very very hard to do. And especially coming out of this Detroit game, where yeah, it's a loss, but I take some positives out of that. And in particular, I think this offense is going to be prolific, consistently put stress on defenses, and I think it's going to get better as the season goes along because I think that offensive line is going to get better. Whether that's George Fant coming back from injury or Abe Lucas at some point or Christian Haynes taking over for Anthony Bradford, some really positive developments on that front in that rotation on Monday. thought Haynes outplayed him. Um. I was talking to Corbin Smith a little bit this morning. He's preparing a piece to do, so keep an eye on Locked on Seahawks and all Seahawks, where he broke down every snap, and and Haynes was more effective. The team was more effective when he was on the field. He just looked like he's ready. Didn't look over his head on Monday. So I think that offense can get even better. Uh, Farrell Brown, you, you know, we there's been some talk this week, some of it from me, on the tight end position and how... Um, his performance has been disappointing so far relative to what we expected from him when he was signed as a free agent. Struggled on Monday a little bit. I thought A.J. Barner was actually the better blocker, and, and Brown's reputation was as an outstanding blocker. I'm not so sure he's 100% healthy yet, or at least not up to speed yet. Um, I, that'll come. I mean, his his resume is what his resume is. Um, but I try to be as objective as possible in this exercise, but I'm also looking for any reason I can to give this team as many wins as I can, right? And keep in mind, at the beginning of the season, I said I wasn't going to do a game-by-game -game prediction because there were just too many unknowns and too much newness. But it felt like an 11-win team to me. And I based that on additions in the offseason, upgrades to the roster, some guys that I expected to take a leap from last year, some guys that I thought would be better utilized in these schemes defensively and off offensively, the reputation of the coaching staff, and the fact that the Seahawks won nine games the last two years, and we all felt like they underachieved with the talent they had on their roster. So in a general sense, I thought 11 wins. Now, how are we going to get there? Not as easy when you start to look at the schedule. Things become more clear four or five weeks into the season. Teams that we didn't think were going to be very good like the Minnesota Vikings, or at least thought they might be good, but would be riding the roller coaster of a rookie quarterback, look like they might be the class of the NFC right now. Some other teams that we thought were going to be really good might not be. And then we see the pieces of our team coming together. So let's start here. And we'll start, obviously, with where things stand currently. And let's put myself here. So they're three and one, as the bell tolls in the background. They are three and one. And just a reminder, I think, for, for those of you who are still really disappointed Monday night, and, and I don't mean disappointed in the result, as in as if some calls had, had gone our way, there, there's some of you out there that are doubting this football team. Some of you out there have said in the comments or said to me on Twitter, really disappointed. I thought Mike McDonald was supposed to be a good defensive coach. We should have just kept Pete Carroll. Completely minimizing the loss of those starters up front. Um, and so I would just ask you this. At the beginning of the season, would you have taken three and one? You would all say yes. Uh, at most people, when the schedule came out, probably had the Miami game as a loss, right? If maybe a healthy Tua Tonga of Iowa, but even with Tua, I'm not so sure. Dolphins just, you know, 
not playing well, not looking like a well-coached team right now. So here we are. We're at three and one. So what does that look like after week five? Come on. I, again, as I said, I'll do a proper preview show. And, and, and when you look at the numbers, when you look at any team in the NFL, you can find reasons to be nervous, right? You look at that defense and you think, okay, Dexter Lawrence, Brian Burns, uh, Kayvon Thibodeau. I mean, those are some guys that can get after the quarterback. And even though it was better Monday and they held Aiden Hutchinson without a sack, he, <laughs> he had a 92 PFF grade and he had pressures on just about every one of his rushes. He was phenomenal. He just didn't cash in. Um, you know, is that is that still going to be a concern? You know, keeping Geno upright. But then you look at some of their numbers in the secondary, their coverage issues that they're dealing with. It's bad. And then even on offense, they're averaging 15 points a game. And there are questions there about whether Daniel Jones should still be the starting quarterback. Certainly questions about whether he should be the long-term quarterback. So I expect them to win this week, especially if they get some of those guys back on defense. They move to four and one. Week six. Now, this is one that, this is a tough one. I, up until this morning, had talked myself into this being a win for them. And here was my thinking on that. And this is assuming that they would get all of those defensive starters back minus probably Murphy still. I mean, maybe they're targeting the Atlanta game for Murphy because you kind of get the, you get a little bit of the extra recovery time. Um, but I'd even be okay holding them out until the Buffalo game. But here's the thing. Even with all their injuries, the 49ers are still the king of the hill. And regardless of how they do this week against Car uh, the Cardinals, win or lose, if they win, they, they come in knowing that a win over Seattle gets them into a tie for the division lead. Uh, a loss pisses them off even more, right? And they and they feel like they have something to prove. And, and that team with their back against the wall can be pretty dangerous. Remember when they lost three straight last year and people were thinking, well, this is when the shine comes off and, and this is when we see that Brock Pur Purdy isn't that dude. Uh, then look at the run they went on for the rest of the year, end up in the Super Bowl. Um, and I thought Thursday night football, that atmosphere at home, you know, a chance for the Seahawks to really prove themselves a second chance because they failed on Monday night. You'll see later my thinking on this. But for now, it's maybe they're just not quite ready. When you look at Mike McDonald's first season as the Baltimore Ravens defensive coordinator in 2022, it took about a half season for things to click in. And I'm going to do a full show on this during kind of the, the mini off week uh, after the 49er game. But it, it took a little time to kick in. You look at the point totals and, and the yardage and what they gave up the first half of the season – took a while for, for all the communication to work and for everybody to be on the same page and for them to figure out where to utilize guys. You know, the role they, they had Kyle Hamilton in changed throughout the season, and then they kind of dialed that in. I expect some more of that will be happening too. And so that's why I went. Also, at a certain point, you start doing this exercise and you just think, come on, this team's not ready to be a 6-1, and 7-1, and 8-1 and one team yet. Right? They're going to lose some games we don't expect them to lose or want them to lose. They're going to win a couple of games along the way that maybe will surprise some people. So I've got them four and two, tied for the division lead. Obviously, they would lose the tiebreaker, but you get another shot at the 49ers in November. So I'm okay with that. And just trying to keep this as realistic as possible. Week seven, I got them bouncing back. They get a little extra time to recover. And now there's some teachable moments. You learn some things. You had a chance. I expect that game against the 49ers to be competitive. Very similar to the Lions game, even if they lose it. I think, I think it could be a very similar experience where we come out of that game and people are saying, hey, they're closer to the Niners than they've been. And so they go to Atlanta, a team that, you know, Seahawks have had their issues with Kirk Cousins over the years. And, you know, if he's fully healthy, they've, they've certainly got some weapons down there, but... There's questions down there, again, even with the new offensive coordinator about offensive utilization. There's some people that want 
Kyle Pitts to be benched in the fantasy football world. There's teams dropping Kyle Pitts. He still hasn't made that leap. Um, and, and, and they're still kind of putting some things together on defense. So it just feels like a game they can win, but I'm, I'm thinking more kind of from a mindset and an emotional standpoint coming back off, off of that a disappointment on Thursday night football. And, you know, hey, maybe if they win on Thursday night, maybe you switch this up and Atlanta becomes a little trappy. Traveling back to that 10 a.m. time slot again and uh, and playing a team that's trying to make their mark and prove themselves and win that division. And you know you got the Bills coming in the next week. Maybe that's a little tricky. Um, but it is a dome, and we know how Geno plays in domes. This is a win for the Seahawks, so they improved to 5-2 and two at that point. And then you come home, and man, oh man, is this going to be a fun game. I mean, the Bills have stubbed their toe last week, right? But we know what that offense can do, and uh, and we know with Sean McDermott, they're all, always going to be competitive defensively. So I've got that one as a loss. You know, it's been kind of a grueling first half of the season. And, uh, you know, you go from the, the high emotion of, of the Thursday night football, which is the third game in, you know, in 13 days or 11 days. Then you travel to the 10 a.m. time zone. Then you come home again and you play a team like Buffalo. I'm just going to chalk that up as a loss. It's a very, very good team. And I think this is one of those games that if I said, oh, they're beating the Bills, that that maybe this whole exercise becomes kind of null and void because that would be just a little too homery, right? But then, it, and, and this is a theme that I expect to continue to see. I think the resolve of this coaching staff and the 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 culture they're building, the mindset that Mike McDonald has, um, I think I think they they fight and scratch and claw, and they work hard and they're smart, and I think they they bounce back from a loss against a team that they feel like they want to be at the level of and they want to compete against. Now they're a little ticked off, and it's a divisional game, and you know the storyline going into this one is going to be. Sean McVay against Mike McDonald. You know, he's been called the Sean McVay of defense. There's going to be a lot of attention on this game. And, you know, who knows how healthy the Rams will be at that point or if that young defense starts to come together. But I think that that defense has so many deficiencies right now that even if they're healthy, uh, there's going to be opportunities to move the football. So maybe it's a shootout, you know, if they get Cup and Nakua back and Kyron Williams is tough and if Stafford's healthy, I mean, he's one of the best out there. Um, but I see them getting a win here, going into the bye. So we've arrived at the bye week. Let's take a little bye in the show and let you know that this episode is brought to you by Manscaped, the global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. Every man knows the unbeatable feeling of a professional shave, right? That fresh barbershop feeling shave. But what if I told you you could get that in your own home and you don't have to wait weeks at a time to get an appointment? Introducing Manscaped's latest innovation, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver, the game-changing tool that brings the luxury of a professional shave right to your own bathroom. Whether you're after that daily, silky, smooth feel, or you like that rugged five o'clock shadow or something in between, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver is your go-to for precision and style every time. And right now, they're offering a great deal on this product. Head over to manscaped.com and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using code Seahawks for 20% off and free shipping. That's promo code Seahawks at manscaped.com, 20% off and free shipping. And then you get a chance to recover. And this is why I switched this up this morning. Originally, I had us winning the Thursday night game, losing in Santa Clara. But... Seahawks are going to be coming off a bye. Coming off the bye, they're going to be six and three at that point. Maybe tied for the division lead still. This game could be for the outright division lead. You're coming off a week in, in which you're you get extra time to recover. Maybe we're talking about Abe Lucas being back for this game. Maybe that's even the target. The reason they're being so coy on some of this stuff. Did you see Abe's new Instagram story this week? You know, deadlifting 550 pounds, saying he's almost there. Now, was he talking about almost there for his personal best in the deadlift or almost there, ready to come back? Because a couple weeks ago, he posted a video of him pulling 
out of pass sets or out of uh, out of his stance. Uh, so at that point, the Seahawks would be seven and three, and you would imagine if this is the result in first place, coming off a bye in the NFC West with the stretch run ahead of them. And then you get two games against the Cardinals in a th- in a three week stretch. And spoiler alert, I've got them sweeping the Cardinals. I think we're starting to see now they had the fun first couple of weeks. The Cardinals are who we thought they were. There's some deficiencies there on defense. They're just not good enough up front. I expect the Seahawks offensive line to be much, much better in week 12. And this is that part of the season. I keep going back to the comment that Greg Bell made on this show. They're going to be a better team in November than they are in September. That defense is going to have, you know, 10 games together now, 11, 12 games together. And, uh, you know, health assumed, I think they beat the Cardinals at home. Then you get the Jets. You fly. This is the the last East Coast game. You fly to the Jets. I'm at some point you have to find losses, right? I can rationalize them, assuming they're fully healthy and playing defense at a Mike McDonald type level by this point in the season. Again, referencing that 2022 season from the Ravens. I can rationalize them winning any of these games. I can rationalize them losing many of them also. The Jets are, this is my thinking here. It's a, it's a tough East Coast game. Weather conditions could be very, very challenging on December 1st in, in New York. And this could be a desperate Jets team by that point. Depending on where they are in the AFC playoff race, if, if they are, and assuming Aaron Rodgers is healthy, if they're not, meeting or or exceeding expectations there, the pressure on them to finish strong is going to be immense. The pressure on Robert Sala and his coaching security is going to be immense. Uh, They're all in this season on Aaron Rodgers and taking this shot. There's a better than zero chance that Devontae Adams will be added to the mix by then to pair with Garrett Wilson. They've got that running back duo. They have an improved offensive line, and you know they're going to play good defense. Got that as a loss. Uh, Then you go to Arizona, and this is a win because I'm going to be there. So, end of story, right? Um, I just, uh, again, it's indoors. You don't have to worry about weather. I think, I think, um, I just, I, I don't think this matchup is a good one for this Arizona Cardinals team this year. Then you come home. It's an interesting finish to the schedule, you know. Don't love that they finish twice on the road, one of them in brutal, brutal weather conditions. But uh, you come home Sunday night football under the lights against Green Bay. I have all the respect in the world uh, for Matt LaFleur. I have all the respect in the world for Jordan Love. But I think you come home, you're flying high, you're seeing the finish line. There's a chance to win the division. There might even be a chance at this point to play for a bye in that one seed, Sunday Night Football under the lights, you missed on your first opportunity to play a primetime game and win it at home because you lost to the Niners in week six. You take care of the Green Bay Packers in this game in front of a national TV audience. But then you turn around and you play a Minnesota Vikings team who also is going to be playing for the one seed. I mean, this who would have thought looking at this game at the beginning of the year that, that it could have the implications that it may have at this point in the season. And side note here, I would hope the schedule makers, if indeed by the end of this year, we see the Niners and Seahawks going head to head. And that looks like a matchup that's going to be just, just must see TV for the next few years moving forward. Can we get the Niners at the end of the schedule? We never seem to, we get them early and mid. We don't get them at the end. We always get the Rams at the end. Uh, let's start saving one of those 49er games for the end uh, as we look forward uh, with both these teams. But that's just that's a tough back-to-back. Uh, I think they're legit. That defense, uh, Brian Flores has not played at a high level. There's buzz already that he might get another head coaching shot because he's done so well there. Um, I think Sam Darnold's for real in the sense that he can operate that Kevin O'Connell offense. I have, I, I'm a huge Kevin O'Connell truther. Um, I think he's he's the real deal. I got Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison would would I would assume be healthy by then. TJ Hawkinson's going to be back by then. They got all those weapons. Aaron Jones looks like a great match for that offense. 
uh, tough to play those two teams back to back uh, and come out with a win. Um, but man, that game could be for all the marbles, right? Then you travel to Chicago, and and while I hate the potential that this is going to be, certainly it's going to be cold, could be snowy. I just think by then, you know, you can make the argument that Caleb Williams is going to get better as the season goes along. I just, uh, I don't think their offensive coordinator is very good. I, I I think about the offensive coordinator versus our defensive coordinator matchup. I think that's advantage Seahawks. Enough said. And they, they're going to have so much on the line at that point. Uh, you're not going to let down against that team. Now, this one was tough. This one was tough because 12 and 5 seems a little rich to me. And so, you know, did they drop that last one? Maybe. Maybe it doesn't mean anything for seeding, but it's a division opponent. I don't, I think McDon Mike McDonald's mentality is. You know, I don't think he's going to allow this team to have letdowns. Maybe they don't play well, sure. But I don't think he's going to let them have letdowns. So I think that's a win. And that puts them at 12 and 5. I know it. I said it felt like an 11 win team, but I think there's been bits and pieces that I've seen. And this is all based on the assumption. And I know it's a big assumption. And so if you want to come at me and criticize me and call me a homer or whatever, but at least note that I'm admitting this. It's based on the assumption that it's going to it's going to get better each week. It's going to come together. The pieces are in place. When the Seahawks defense is all healthy, you cannot tell me that's not a top 10 defense in this league running that scheme with those bodies. There's just too much talent there. If, if, if you don't believe that, then you're probably – so emotionally attached to another team, you just don't want to believe the Seahawks can be good. I also think, again, that offense is going to continue to get even better. And that offensive line is going to get better. And I think this is a season we've seen John Schneider make deadline deals before. And I'm not talking about a big, huge, splashy fantasy football deal. Those are tough to get. But he'll add someone at a position of need that will help. And he also, I, I take you back a month and remind you of what he said in regards to Abe Lucas. 100% confidence that he's going to be back at some point this season and play. He just couldn't tell you when that's going to be. You see the videos of Abe working out. No knee brace. The rumors are out there. Maybe it was patella tendon, which does take longer to recover from. Maybe it was the old, we haven't heard this term in a while, probably because it's just become so commonplace, microfracture surgery, which would seem to make sense with the kind of the mystery surrounding the injury to begin with, how they didn't think there was a surgical answer for it, how Pete Carroll called it potentially chronic. And then, you know, the microfracture fracture procedure where you drill into the bone and it, it, it increases blood flow and it, it helps healing. That Maybe there was something a little bit kind of cutting edge that happened there if Abe Lucas comes back at anything close to 100% at some point this season it changes it changes all the optics in my opinion especially if you have Christian Haynes ultimately taking over for Anthony Bradford there I think the upside's better I think he's a better player and I think for the first time he had a chance to show that on Monday and it's only a matter of time before he takes over the starting job so that's where I'm at with that what do you think guys uh, what do you have which games do you disagree with? <laughs> Obviously, big disclaimer. This is a ridiculous exercise, but we do it for fun, don't we? Uh, tomorrow, excited about this, Connor Benatendi from All Seahawks and Locked On Seahawks, an outstanding find for Corbin Smith to add to his team, said something on Locked On the other day that really sparked my interest. I'm not going to give it away. Uh, well, I'm not going to give away the answer but he's going to come on the show tomorrow. We're going to talk about who's the best player on this Seahawks team right now. The best player. It might surprise you. It'll surprise some of you. If it wasn't a surprise, then it, I probably wouldn't do the show because it wouldn't be as intriguing. Um, but I think it's compelling enough that we're going to have that discussion because there's some other national voices that are saying the same thing. And, uh, and it's pretty cool. Follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. Forever and always go Hawks. 
All the different ways to support the show are down in the description. We'll see you next time.